Isabella and one of the figures in this center. And uh, uh, today he is going to speak about protestant disorders in Houdanis. And uh, he prepared for you a good surprise in the intervention of Roger Shaw. So I, I am sure that you will get the benefit of joining Professor Dunya for next Tuesday. Professor Dunya. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hussein. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Testing disorders on hemodialysis patients. So, uh, potassium uh, is highly contained in plants to the extent that the term potassium was originally derived from the word potash, which means plant ashes after evaporation of water. And before Agriculture needs potassium rich uh, fertilizers for plants because plants use a lot of potassium. So it is a cation and it is necessary for all living cells, especially nerve and muscles. Potassium is very important, it maintains resting membrane potential. Acid base and osmotic balance, and is very important in production of protein and glycogen. As you know, potassium is the main intracellular cation, while sodium is the main extracellular cation. We usually eat about 100 milliequivalent per day that is largely excreted in you. And there is a balance between extra and intracellular fluid. Some reasons might cause potassium efflux, like acidosis, while others, like alkalosis, will cause potassium influx. <coughs> As you can see here, muscles contain the biggest portion of potassium. This kalemia is common among hemodialysis patients, and as you might know, hyperkalemia is more common among our hemodialysis patients, while hypokalemia is more frequent in peritoneal dialysis patients. Both hyper and hypokalemia are common causes of death among hemodialysis patients. Dialysis dose is, of course, an important factor for hyper and hypokalemia. Additionally, residual kidney function and acid base status are very really important. Food also is a big issue. Here are fruits that I that are high in potassium and the potassium level will gradually decrease here, and then we have fruits with low potassium. This is, of course, impossible to remember everything about food and potassium. We are not dietitians, but at least you might tell your patient that instead of taking cantaloupe, you might have watermelon or pineapple. Instead of taking dried, grapes or raisins, you might have fresh grapes. You might also tell him that mandarin contains a little bit lower potassium compared to orange. Pears contain low potassium, while mango contain very high potassium. 
And the tradition is to tell your patient with hyperkalemia, please receive apple instead of banana. Relative to juices, of course, all juices contain potassium, but again, apple juice, grape juice, and cranberry juice contain much more potassium than other juice. And here, in terms of comparison of juice and original fruit, you might notice that orange juice was put as containing higher potassium than one uh, orange uh, fruit because juice will need more than one uh, fruit to have like a cup of juice. Again, as I have just mentioned, plants are very rich in potassium, so vegetables are rich in potassium. And again, these are vegetables with high potassium and those are vegetables with low potassium. And again, I might tell my patients with hyperkalemia, please receive fresh beans instead of dry beans. Peas instead of potatoes, Spanish and lentils. You might use vegetable uh, salad, but please use cucumber, lotus, instead of uh, uh, tomato and carrots. And please avoid tomato um, sauce and use it instead of garlic, onion, and lemon. Again, Breakfast for rich people contain high potassium, like bran, milk, and nuts. While bread and usual uh, lunch food, like rice and pasta, contain a relatively lower potassium level. Again, desserts, chocolate, and nuts contain a very high level of potassium while cakes, pies, and cookies without <coughs> chocolate and nuts contain relatively low level of potassium. Likewise, tea and small amounts of coffee are safer than broth, for example. Apart from food, there are many other causes of dyskinemia. So, glucose might cause both hyper and hypertension. If glucose is high with inefficient or uh, deficient insulin, like in diabetic patients, then hyperglycemia uh, will cause hypertension. But if glucose is high in the context of normal insulin or you might also give some insulin from outside, then hyperkalemia, hyperglycemia will cause shift of glucose and shift of potassium and hyperkalemia. So both uh, this lipidemia, this uh, kalemia might happen with glucose, but depends on the availability of it. Hyper and hypoaldosteronemia. Immediate post dialysis compared to rebound one or two hours after dialysis. Hypercatabolic states are here, while vomiting and diarrhea will cause hypokalemia. Muscle exercise and fits will also cause hypokalemia. Depending on the time of diuretic, this kalemia will happen especially if the patient has residual kidney function, beta blockers and beta stimulants. A parts will cause hyperkalemia, likewise non steroidals and calcium inhibitors. Blood transfusion, especially old blood, will also cause hyperkalemia. Take care of what's called pseudo-dyskinemia. So
So, cooling of his hand will cause pseudo hypokalemia, while warming of his hand will cause pseudo hypokalemia. Tourniquet and narrow pore needle will also cause fake hyperkalemia. And don't forget, with patients with blood dyspraxia, with very high leukocytes in the place, it's, they will be fake hyperkalemia. In fact, manifestations of both hyper and hyperkalemia are nearly similar. So both can present <coughs> as asymptomatic or they might affect muscles in the form of muscle weakness that might progress to paralysis is rhabdomyolysis in case of hyperkalemia. Both also can affect cardiovascular system in the form of palpitation, arrhythmias, and might even end with arrest. ECG findings might show the same in both hyper and hyperkalemia in the form of bradycardia, VKX, and arrest. However, there are some distinguishing ECG findings in hyper compared to hyperkalemia. So, in hyperkalemia, we might find flattening of P wave. First, uh, hyper tented or peaked T wave followed by flattening of P wave, and lastly, uh, widening of QRS complex that restages serious arrhythmia and might show what's called sine wave or sinusoidal pattern. B T wave is non-specific. You might have B T wave, despite that normal potassium due to other reasons, and it usually appears with acute hyperkalemia, so it doesn't usually happen in our hemodialysis patients who are accustomed for long-term hyperkalemia, except if potassium is at higher levels. ECG findings are deceiving, and in fact there is disparity between ECG findings and potassium level, therefore Serum potassium level is the guide for therapy. For hypokalemia, we will have the reverse relative to ECG findings. So we might have flattened T wave, peaked P wave, and U wave might also appear. So it appears that the ideal pre paralysis potassium is about 5 to 5.5 millimole per liter, and that mortality much increases if potassium is very high or low. Low potassium association to mortality has been documented in many studies. So, how can we prevent this kalemia? Of course, you have to talk with the patient about diet and that. Size of the serving is very important, so he might receive some potassium rich diet but in moderation. And despite controversy, yet boiling of vegetables might help to decrease potassium content. Of course, efficient dialysis, correction of acidosis, Avoid of drugs that cause hyperkalemia. Avoid fasting will help to decrease the prevalence of hyperkalemia. And if the patient has residual kidney function and there is an indication for diuretic use, again, low diuretic might help. But again, be aware of autotoxicity. What about dialysate potassium? The usual level, what's called normal potassium bath, is low potassium, which is 2 millimole per liter. In some patients with hyperkalemia, we might use what's called low potassium bath or even potassium free bath. <coughs> However, 
this formula has been criticized to be associated with more cardiovascular mortality. And this is a report just published this month regarding mistakes we make in the and the title was we use dialysate potassium levels that are too low in human diabetes. And the authors didn't object that hyperkalemia is risky. Rather, uh, they were concerned about rapid removal of potassium and they advised to search about other strategies to decrease potassium apart from decreasing potassium dialysate and reducing potassium in a very short period because this is associated with high mortality. So it is rational to use normal bath if redialysis potassium is from 4 to 5.5 and use high or low baths if potassium is higher or lower than this level. And this is uh, the available form, uh, formula of uh, dialysate in Egypt. And as you might not, uh, this is normal bath. And there is a concentration about low potassium bath which might be associated with higher mortality. And unfortunately, we don't have what's called high potassium bath, which is very important, especially for patients with re-dialysis potassium below 4. We might also use what's called cation exchange resin, and this might be in the form of calcium or sodium uh, uh, formulas, and uh, this is efficient in removing uh, potassium, but it is slowly working. Some side effects, and especially for sodium uh, containing cation exchange resin. <coughs> what about treatment? Regarding treatment of hyperkalemia, we can not hear that some treatment forms are working immediately, like IV calcium. Some are working in like 20 minutes, like beta stimulants. And some need hours to work, like sodium micropenate and cation exchange resins. <coughs> of course, one of the immediate treatment regimens is the best treatment. Again, we might notice that some of treatment formulas are temporary, just shifting potassium inside the cell, while others are actual treatment forms, like cathodic exchange resins and hemodialysis. First, you have to know if this is true or fake, like anemia, as I have just mentioned. Second, you have to determine the severity of hyperkalemia, and it is rational to consider levels from 5.5 to 6 in hemodialysis patients as mild hyperkalemia. No worry, no panic. Patient is chronic on dialysis. He might come tomorrow to be dialyzed, except if you have some problem with medical legal issues. But from the scientific point of view, this is mild hyperkalemia. You might uh, just uh, uh, advise the patient to avoid high potassium diet till the morning. On the contrary, if the patient has severe hyperkalemia or there are ECG changes or symptoms at any level above 5.5, then we are in emergency situation, especially in situations that are associated with rapid rise in potassium and hypoxia. As I have just 
mentioned, the mild hyperkalemia is common and often well tolerated in this patient. Again, urgent treatment is required in patients with levels more than 7 and or ECG changes and symptoms. So, traditionally speaking, we have to protect heart. How can we protect heart? This with IV calcium. Again, there is a concern about IV calcium in hemodialysis patients. Why? Number one, it's only indicated that severe manifestations of hyperkalemia, not only tended T wave, but extending to like widening QRS complex or flattened P wave. This is number one. Number two, you have another concern about metastatic calcification and use of IV calcium. So don't rush, don't give every patient IV calcium, leave it for special situations. If the patient in a situation of rapid uh, rise of potassium, like hypercatabolism, especially if he has <coughs> high levels or ECG findings apart from BT wave, then give IV calcium. The second category of treatment is to remove potassium, and the best ever treatment is hemodialysis. So, in, in, in authorities which lack immediate nephrology service, they might give furosemides or a neuric patient, cations change reason which we work after hours, and we all know that the best treatment is to dialyze the patient. Remember that there is what's called rebound one or two hours after hemodialysis. So don't be happy. If you have potassium 4 immediately after dialysis, this might increase again to 6 after 2 hours, especially in patients with pre uh, potassium levels, uh, high pre potassium levels, or patients who are using high uh, uh, sodium dialysate. We might use cathinox to change resin for prevention and treatment. Again, this is calcium containing cathinox to change resin, and this can be given orally or rectally. But remember again that this will work after some hours. It is efficient. It removes the potassium. So every gram will remove one millimolar one millimol of uh, potassium per liter, but not per liter of blood, of course, of, uh, but liter of gut content. Because if one gram will remove one millimol per liter, so just five grams will remove all potassium. So this is not the case. It will just remove one millimol per liter uh, from the gut. Oh, okay. And we have another type which is called sodium cation exchange resin. And this is more serious than calcium containing cation exchange resin. And it was the first to be approved, but during the last seven years, there was FDA black box for its use, especially with solid, because of associated serious GIT problems. And this will increase if we use it in the form of enema. Two other new potassium uh, uh, hyperkalemia medications. The first is zirconium. This is a cation exchange that doesn't swell and it contains micropores that will entrap uh, minerals and we interact potassium much more than other minerals and I think we are now in phase 3 studies and this is 
a study of zirconium using it for one month among patients with hyperkalemia on outpatient basis. And as we can see here, the least level was with 15 gram three times per day compared to glacier patients. Another uh, more recent uh, uh, study and ZS Pharma announces FDA acceptance of uh, their submission for FDA approval. The expected FDA approval will be very soon. Remember that zirconium might cause significant edema. Another new medicine is metilomer or valdesa. Again, phase three studies, but this medicine has already been FDA approved. Might cause significant GIT absence and hypermagnesemia. And this is a study from the New England Journal of Medicine about patillomere. However, unfortunately, some compare its side effects to the original uh, chitinate, like uh, sodium chitinate. So, zirconium might cause significant edema while uh, patillomere might cause a GIT absence from a high level magnesium. Low diuretic might be also helpful, especially in patients who bring good amount of fuel. And the last treatment is shift potassium from blood to cell, and unfortunately this is rapidly acting uh, maneuver, but temporary maneuver, glucose insulin, nebulized salvital mole. However, unfortunately, this is not very efficient among our hemodialysis patients in contrast to other regular patients. Therefore, you cannot use it alone. Again, sodium bicarbonate is not recommended except if it is true acidosis. And again, sodium bicarbonate is not that efficient in hemodialysis patients compared to other patients. And the last part of my talk is treatment of hypokalemia. We have IV and oral potassium supplementation. We have diet. Please increase your diet, and you might need some uh, effort to change the dogma of the patient. Should I eat banana? Yes, please eat banana. You have hypokalemia. Potassium sparing diuretics might be used, and it is said that the maximum dose is 25 milligram of spironolactone with regular and meticulous monitoring of potassium. And that you have to revise the dialysis dose. And you have to revise the dialysate potassium. As I have just mentioned, if pre dialysis potassium level is below four, please use high potassium power. And if you are unfortunate like us and you don't have high potassium power, please give intradialytic slow potassium during dialysis. And potassium supplementations, again, this is very silly, very dangerous to use uh, among hemodialysis patients, but again, you might need to use it. So what are the indications of urgent replacement? These are the indications of urgent replacement. ECG changes, myocardial infarction, situations with hypoxia, digitalis intoxication, because hypokalemia will increase digitalis intoxication, muscle paralysis, and remember that just one quart potassium level below normal means very big deficit because potassium is basically intracellular. So if extracellular level decreases, this means that you have enormous losses. 
Again, IV potassium is usually not needed. And the maximum rate of infusion, preferably, is 10 millimol per hour. And remember that one gram contains about 15 millimol. And what about oral potassium supplementation? It is much weaker. 50 millimoles will give only one millimol per liter. And, for example, in Egypt, tablets contain only eight millimoles. And serum contains even less amount of potassium. So, take home message. This kalinia is not uncommon among our hemodialysis patients. Potassium disorders could be associated with serious complications. Treatment of potassium disorders in hemodialysis might be a little bit different compared to other patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Antonia, for this presentation, which is very comprehensive. Now let's go back for questions. Yes. Yes. If there is a bus still, no digoxin in the other species. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Professor Tonya. Uh, and uh, I think we have 15 minutes for break. 15 minutes. We still have only one presentation, and we'll finish. Then they will receive their dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Promise. Good <laughs> morning. Yeah. Shukla. Yeah. <laughs> 